Just a heads up before we get into today's video, go and support the author and check out his YouTube channel, Black Volumes. It'll be linked below in the description. In my tireless pursuit of answers, I found fresh questions of terror. Comfort is an alien notion to me. I've always been afraid, always failing to still my brain's ever worrying cogs. But from a young age, I aimed to cease my mind's endless worrying. I poured every ounce of my energy into becoming an engineer. It has always eased my nerves to fix things. Of course, nothing was ever enough. I needed absolute certainty. And I wasn't going to find that on our little green rock. Naturally, I looked to the stars. In the early 2000s, shortly after graduating from Cambridge University, I moved to America and secured a job at NASA. I wanted to be a part of something bigger than me, an organization focused on exploring the deepest crevices of the universe. The date was January 2nd, 2023. It was a day unlike any other. The office was filled with the excitable chatter of my colleagues, the folk who typically would have their heads silently buried in their paperwork. The air on this particular day, however, was filled with a jittery, magnetic energy. Connor, you'll never guess what just leaked, Adam eagerly said, motioning for me to follow. I shrugged and followed my friend out of the office. What's happening? I said. You're going to lose your mind, my colleague replied. We made our way into one of the compound's main facilities, a building which housed NASA's assembly line of rockets. I had a hunch that Adam's exciting news might be related to DM-50, the dozen minus rocket. After all, the bulky vessel was nearing completion. No low-level employees had been given any inkling as to what purpose the spacecraft would serve. My colleague and I rounded the corner of the vessel, and we found Dr. Stanley Jacobs talking to a few physicists. He was a graying, pale-faced fellow with a chap skin, the sort of man who had physically aged beyond his years. He could have been 64 or 46. The weary-faced man groaned at the sight of Adam, but my friend didn't care. He was fixated on the screen behind the physicist. It depicted various graphs and charts, a foreign language to me. Everybody's been biting Stanley's ear off after he mistakenly forwarded an email to Jenny in accounting. Last year, Jacobs discovered an anomaly at the edge of our galaxy. Adam gleefully whispered, an unidentified phenomenon that vaguely resembles a black hole, though its physical makeup is unlike anything previously discovered in human history. And NASA has been intercepting frequencies from the other side. Using telescopic data, they've created musical tones which sound like, well, who knows? Storms on unseen planets, forms of alien communication, a parallel version of our reality, perhaps. This sounds like fiction. Why didn't we hear about this when Jacobs found the anomaly a year ago? I asked. My colleague shrugged. You know what the media is like. This could be huge or it could be nothing. But Jacobs is suggesting that it might be a tear between universes. Hypothetically, I scoffed, though secretly my interest was piqued. Oh, come on, Connor, you're always talking about the mysteries of the universe. Well, it turns out that there's more than one universe, Adam said. And Frank heard that they're planning an expedition with the DM-50. I told you something big was happening. Why else would they have contacted Dozen Minus? It's unofficial, highly classified technology. My heartbeat started to quicken as I contemplated what my friend had said. Parallel universes, I thought. Could these distant worlds offer the answers that I have always wanted? The small group of physicists eventually dispersed and Adam nodded his head at Stanley. Talk to him about the expedition. 
he didn't want anything to do with me, but this could be your shot to see space. My friend whispered before walking away. May I help? Dr. Jacobs asked, overhearing us. I, does the DM-50 expedition have any openings for engineers? I asked. The man sighed. You shouldn't know about that, but you're not the first person to ask. This day has been... You're going to explore the anomaly, aren't you? I asked, eagerly interrupting the physicist. Did you hear something? Wait, are you even an engineer? You're not some government servant on a mission to shut down this project, are you? Dr. Jacobs asked, lifting an eyebrow. No, I just need to be on that ship, sir. You likely already have plenty of engineers attached to the project, but... We do, so I wouldn't get your hopes up. The man interjected, packing his briefcase. I won't pretend to be some indispensable genius, I said. But this is more than a job to me. I don't really care about NASA. I just, I've always wanted answers to, well, everything. The men carefully examined me. What's your name? Dr. Jacobs asked, pulling a piece of paper out of his coat pocket. Connor Bridges, I said, composing myself. The physicist nodded and scribbled my name. There aren't any official openings, Connor, but I know that look in your eyes. It's what guided me to this place, too. It's what prompted me to chase Harriet's eye. Harriet's eye, I asked. The man solemnly nodded. The name of the anomaly, uh, my late daughter. Sorry, I quietly replied. Jacobs cleared his throat. The DM-50 could always use an extra engineer. My eyes glistened and I immediately accepted the offer. I couldn't quite wrap my brain around the idea of going to space. Now, of course, months after my voyage of terror, I try to pretend that it never happened. After ten months of training, launch day arrived. Dr. Stanley Jacobs and Dr. Elizabeth Farrow, his research partner, had been developing the logistics of the mission for the better part of two years. Our stealth vessel, the DM-50, would venture to the edge of the Milky Way, undetected by the people of Earth, and we would send various automated research vessels into Harriet's eye. And given promising results, a manned mission would follow. It was an airtight plan. The launch was a surreal experience. Sitting in a near silent ship equipped with cloaking technology, we left Earth behind. Not a soul on the ground watched. It was a week-long journey. Using dozen minus technology, we achieved the impossible. We not only traveled to the farthest reach of the Milky Way, but we did so within an unthinkably fast time frame. The reason for Dr. Jacob's hurry would eventually become horribly clear. From the windows of DM-50, the crew surveyed Harriet's eye with doe-eyed, blissfully unaware faces. A gaggle of school children dazzled by the mysteries of space. As we approached, the eye grew from a blackened blemish on the horizon into a ginormous wound that had splintered the very fabric of reality. A hauntingly spectacular sight. The unmanned vessels were launched once we had reached a suitably near yet safe distance from Harriet's eye. We watched as the tiny metallic blobs jettisoned from DM-50. And then one by one the three vessels were swallowed by the blackened mouth. As we found ourselves hovering in space, at the edge of oblivion, waiting for the robotic explorers to return. The majority of low-level workers had nothing to do but twiddle their thumbs. We couldn't proceed until the data from the unmanned vessels had been retrieved and analyzed. Not quite the adventure you imagined, Mr. Bridges. Stanley Jacobs asked, grinning. The two lead physicists sat on the opposite side of the canteen table. I smiled at the pair of them, while hurriedly finishing my mouthful of food. It wasn't often that lowly crew members would have the opportunity to talk to the ever-elusive lead physicists. 
Actually, it's no different from a day in the office. Sitting around and waiting for something to do, I said. Miss Stanley laughed. Well, it's just as tedious for Elizabeth and me. Uh, too right. But I enjoy lunch breaks because I get to spend some time with people other than Ham. Dr. Elizabeth Farrells chirped. I hate to pry, but... Well, have you made any progress? I asked. I won't pretend to understand the physics of this expedition, but... Oh, don't be so modest, Connor, Elizabeth said. You're an engineer. I'm sure you understand more than you pretend to know. He's a mysterious egg, Jacobs chuckled. Did you know that he twisted my arm to get on this mission? He was almost as determined as me. Almost. Elizabeth raised an inquisitive eyebrow. Yes, I do seem to remember him showing up quite late in the training. Were you keen to see action, Connor? The woman had kind eyes. Elizabeth was middle-aged, possibly the same age as Stanley. But the years had been kinder to her soft-skinned, rosy-cheeked face. She reminded me of my late mother. Something about her velvety voice encouraged me to open up. It wasn't about the adventure, Dr. Farrow. I've just... I've always been afraid, I said. I've always wanted answers to unanswerable questions. And this phenomenon seems so fundamentally juxtaposed to the reality which surrounds it. Before either of the physicists could reply, our food tray slid to the right, as did we. And everybody cried in confusion as their bodies were limply flung to the side of the unexpectedly leaning vessel. My temple connected with the edge of the table drawing blood, and I gripped either side of the canteen bench until my knuckles were white. Dozens of dazed and injured workers clamored to their feet. We all hurried to our respective stations ready to assess the damage. Though the ship had corrected its balance, it continued to quake uncontrollably. And as we ran to the engineering office, my crew members and I shuddered at the sight of complete blackness beyond DM-50's windows. The stars and planets had disappeared. Brace for impact. A voice shrieked over the ship's intercom. The ship's outer body groaned under the strain of seismic pressure and I tumbled to the office's metallic floor. The other engineers and I clutched in any fixed things that we could find, and we braced for our lives as DM-50 finally came to a blunt and jarring halt. Everybody lay as still as possible. Murmurs of pain echoed around the office. Light fixtures flicked unstably and various alarms sounded in a calamitous cacophony. All personnel report to the main bridge, a voice announced over the tannoy. My fellow wounded engineers stumbled weakly to the corridor outside our office, but we did not walk to the main bridge. We speechlessly filled the corridor and each of us stared out of the windows which lined the walkway. Beyond DM-50 there lay a near colorless hellscape, the only light stemmed from a luminous blue orb in the distance. A white dwarf, one woman said, gasping. Do they usually look like that? A man asked. The edges of the orb seemed to dance erratically, and the ocean beyond our ship was littered with tidal waves of crumbling rocks. Stray pieces clattered against the windows of DM-50, and then I realized that one of the larger distant rocks was a planet. It appeared to be cleanly split down the middle, as if it were two halves of a cracked coconut shell. This foreign place was not the Milky Way. The very laws of physics seemed to contradict our reality. We entered Harriet's eye, a man whispered. It's another universe, somebody muttered. All personnel to the main bridge. The Tanoi voice repeated urgently. Snapping out of the existential fever which had seized our bodies, the engineering crew hurried through the walkways of the ship, and we joined everybody in the main bridge area. Beyond the chattering crowd, I could see Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Farrell standing sheepishly behind Captain Bolton. Quiet, the captain bellowed. The entire crew immediately complied. 
We tried to fixate on our bearded, stern-faced leader, but our eyes kept wandering to the swirling kaleidoscope of colors and bombardment of rocks beyond the bridge's main viewport. An unidentifiable force has pulled us into the anomaly, Captain Poulton said. We're working towards immediately returning home, and we do not know what we might find here. The data has not yet been retrieved from the unmanned vessels, so these are uncharted waters. Anxious murmuring resumed. Enough, the captain shouted. Before we attempt to enter the anomaly again, we must deem that DM-50 is in ship shape. I'll leave that to our engineers, but time is of the essence. Isn't that right, Dr. Jacobs? There was a disquieting tension between the lead physicist and the captain. Dr. Jacobs cleared his throat. The anomaly is shrinking. We should have told you that we have a limited window in which to explore what lies beyond it. That's not all, Captain Poulton growled. Stanley cleared his throat nervously, but Elizabeth placed a delicate hand on his shoulder. We have entered a dying universe, one that is collapsing in on itself, she said, prompting a gasp of horror from the crowd. The anomaly is our only exit, and it will soon close for good. Dr. Jacob sighed. I believe that Harriet's eye might well be more than a rip in the lining of reality. It might be the crunch point for this universe. All matter in this reality will collide here. Anarchy ensued. Crew members hurled abuse at the physicists and a few furious individuals lunged at Jacobs. The captain and several security officers restrained the enraged crew members. We can't change what has been done. Captain Poulton yelled, shoving the mob backwards. When we return to Earth, Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Farrell will stand trial for their crimes. Until then, we have one objective. Save every last person aboard this ship. And the crew worked tirelessly over the following hours, but things only worsened. We were sitting ducks at the entrance to the anomaly. The ever-closing seal between two universes. That became apparent as the ship's body began to wail painfully. The onslaught of rocks loudened against the metalwork and reinforced glass panes. DM-50 began to quake on a near constant basis, and whenever I would glance out of the ship's windows, I became acutely aware of a burgeoning light in the distance. The sinister, swirling glow of a trillion galaxies converging. The incoming flurry of long dead planets and moons. The universe was collapsing, and we were at the epicenter. I eventually slumped into my bunk bed at the brink of exhaustion, but I found myself unable to shut my eyes. Eager to busy myself, I switched on my terminal to run a few final diagnostics for the evening. The sooner that we could give the captain the green light to go, the better. I was surprised to find a notification in my inbox. Hey Connor, I've been bored out of my mind and I'm still upset that Dr. Jacobs wouldn't let me join the crew. So I decided to do some research on the big man. I talked to Frank in IT because he owed me a favor and he let me look at some of the transmissions that Jacobs has been deciphering. NASA received signals from the anomaly that seemed communicative Connor and it was a two-way flow. Jacobs responded. He talked to something. You need to ask him about that. The thought of receiving a message from alien life, whether in our universe or another, had once filled me with such excitement, but I was now filled with inexplicable dread by the idea of Jacobs communicating with some unseen intelligence. It could have been the secrecy surrounding the communication, Jacobs hadn't told anyone that he had already found something sentient beyond Harriet's eye. Why? My gut instinct was to confront him. I slid out of bed, got dressed, and left the engineering quarters. The ship was eerily quiet on my walk to the main laboratory, other than the roar of space debris which had become a form of white noise. 
As expected, I found Dr. Jacobs hunched over his desk and busying himself with work. The white glow of the screen illuminated the man's gaunt, possessed face. He hardly looked human. Why didn't you tell us? I asked. The expedition would never have been greenlit, Dr. Jacobs muttered without looking up. Good, I said. We never would have faced such horror. Dr. Jacobs removed his glasses and eyed me with disappointment. What happened to that young man who wanted answers? We're not going to get any answers here, I said. Certainly not about that thing you heard in the darkness. Stanley Jacobs froze, eyeing me for a few seconds as droplets of sweat collected on his furrowed brow. How do you know about that? He whispered. He only spoke to me. I shivered. He? Stanley's frown lifted as he realized that I knew nothing. Go to bed, Mr. Bridges, he said, returning his gaze to the laptop. What were you hoping to find? I asked. The man scoffed. Another universe, Connor. Something greater than us. And I calculated that we had no more than a couple of years before Harriet's eye would seal forever. A couple of... I stopped mid-sentence. How long do we have before this reality collapses, Jacobs? Months, weeks? Days, Stanley whispered. Fist clenching on their own accord, I stormed across the lab and towered over the man, who quickly shrank into his desk chair. What could we possibly learn in days, Stanley? You brought us out here to die, I barked. I wanted this to happen sooner, he retorted. But the airheads at NASA had to plan carefully. Unofficial projects are always messy. Yeah, especially when they result in countless deaths, I said. The anomaly almost tore the ship in half. We might not even be able to fix it. We might die, don't you care? I have every faith in you, Dr. Jacobs said, returning his gaze to the numbers on his screen. And I had every faith in you, I replied. You're lucky to even be here, the physicist snarled. As we continued the back and forth discussion, our voices gradually raised. It was only after ten minutes of running in circles that we realized that we were competing not with each other, but with the growing sound outside of the ship. And when we turned our heads to the laboratory windows, Stanley and I gasped in unison. The dying universe's void was filling with light at an increasingly rapid pace, and DM-50's trembling foundations felt less stable with every passing second. No, this isn't right. We should have time. Stanley breathlessly cried. I still have so much data to collect. I need to. All personnel to stations, a voice announced over the intercom. Flight to Harriet's Eye will commence in five minutes. Brace for impact. We've barely run 50% of the necessary diagnostics, I said. Who cares about the ship, Connor? Dr. Jacobs maniacally cried. This is greater than anything in human history. This is... What, what are you? The wispy, disembodied voice rattled sharply around my skull, like a coin stuck in a jar. It's me. I'm here, Stanley whispered. I did as you asked. The physicist noticed my horrified expression and he realized that I had heard the voice too. He wasn't as special as he thought himself to be. I became aware of the fact that all sound outside the ship had ceased. The terrifying convergence of galaxies continued beyond the window, but there was quiet. Only that haunting whisper permeated the silence. A new, a new land, land to conquer. conquer, the voice hissed. Thank, Thank you, you for showing, showing me the, the door. door. I want to see her, Dr. Jacobs wailed, throwing his arms outwards. You said that I would see Harriet. She is in the place of all dead things. Come closer, let me show you, the chilling voice said. Outside the window amidst the multicolored glare of approaching galaxies, I saw two forming bodies, red gassy spheres of biblical proportions. 
and as black specks emerged in their centers, I realized what they were. Eyes of unfathomable enormity. I tried to scream, but my quivering, narrowing throat was unwilling. Could it have been strangled, perhaps, by the paranormal deity? Black tendrils emerged from the abyss of the universe's ever-nearing edge. They curled forwards and took the shape of colossal, godlike fingers. Fingers that were reaching towards us. The ship suddenly lurched forwards. The captain, who had looked upon the horror in the depths of space, commenced our voyage into Harriet's eye. Thankful for the slightest hope, I looked to the sobbing physicist beside me. Harriet, he cried. You, you promised. With a thunderous clap, the tremendous ear-shattering sound of the collapsing universes returned, as if the terrifying entity with eyes like blazing gateways to hell were roaring in fury at our attempted escape. Those ever-stretching fingers soared towards our spacecraft, and DM-50 began to jolt from side to side. A trillion swirling lights soared towards our ship as the universe's collapse quickened. I screamed as I finally fathomed the horror of being crushed by a universe. But then the pulling began, the pull of the shriveled, near-closed anomaly. Blackness began to envelop our ship. We were entering Harriet's eye. As Stanley and I steadied ourselves against a nearby desk, I closed my eyes and thought of home, the little green rock that I had shunned my entire life. In that moment, it was the only thing that I wanted. Following an explosion of sound, everything stopped. All sound, all movement. And when I opened my eyes, we were surrounded by life. We had returned to our universe. There were bright, burning stars in the distance, fully formed planets, serene tides of space that gladly carried us home, a long and quiet journey home. I rushed to the laboratory window to eye the fading anomaly. Did it close or simply fade from view? I still don't know. Part of me believes in the darkened distance of space, I might have seen those terrible black tendrils slinking through the terror between realities. The hand of a god fleeing its dying universe to claim another. Dr. Jacobs and Dr. Farrow await trial for what they did. I've been denied visitation privileges, but I need to see him. I need to understand the last thing that he said to me. It lives. He had a sullen disposition, so I thought that I could brighten his day with a smile. That was a terrible idea. He certainly wasn't the only gloomy character that I had ever spotted on the early evening train. For many of us, it's a very long journey home from the city. We wear crestfallen expressions, decompressing after another soul-crushing day at work. Nevertheless, this particular man caught my attention. He was standing on the opposite side of the carriage, firmly fixated on the doors behind me. His vacant, brown eyes hardly seeming to register what they were seeing. He had a pale complexion and his skin sagged, as if it were too loose for the bald head on which it hung. Most importantly, he was sulking. I smiled. If only I could retract that smile. Anyway, I beamed brightly, striving to cheer the man up. It took a long time for the sour-faced gentleman to notice the upbeat teenage girl who was facing towards them. Well, it probably only took a couple of seconds, but that certainly feels like a long time to maintain an unreciprocated smile. Eventually, thankfully, the man began to turn. His expression did not change. His body did not move. His head simply rotated enough to ensure that his eyes were firmly locked onto mine. I waited for his frown to turn upside down. It didn't. Slowly, sinisterly, the man shook his head. It was only a slight movement, but that made it all the more intimidating. He shook his head as if to say, You shouldn't be doing that. 
My glowing grin immediately dissipated, of course. I cast my eyes to the ground, feeling humiliated. I pulled my phone out of my pocket, ignoring the burning sensation that scorched my cheeks. How many more stops, I wondered. The most perturbing thing about the entire situation was that the man did not stop looking at me. Despite my averted gaze, I could still feel those beady little eyes boring into my skull. I could see him in my peripheral vision. He did not move, he just stared sullenly. I did what I always did in uncomfortable situations. I went on Reddit. I switched to my throwaway account and asked for advice on dealing with odd people. I fully explained my predicament. Most people just called him a creep, and they said to move down the carriage. One user popped up on my private chat. I won't include his username, but he had something more unsettling to tell me. Why would you smile at the morose man? I thought that he was screwing with me. I asked why he was calling this stranger the morose man. From your description, I realized who you had seen. I played along with the prankster, asking about the morose man, who I assumed to be some sort of urban legend. He minds his own business unless somebody disturbs his peace, and you just disturbed him. You need to get off that train and run. His wrath eventually subsides and he goes in his way. He will pursue you until midnight. My chest started to tighten. I was no believer in ghost stories, but I felt something that I still can't explain. I knew that the Reddit user was telling the truth, and I felt it. I could feel it in the man's awful eyes, which were still watching me. I asked the mystery messenger what the man was going to do. He wasn't doing anything particularly threatening. He was standing still. Why does that matter Just stay away from him? What time is it in your part of the world? 6.59pm Right, 5 hours. Just stay away from him and make sure that you avoid doorways. I thought that final sentence was a little peculiar, but it was definitely no more peculiar than the user's claim that this dismal gentleman was some sort of unearthly being. That being said, I couldn't ignore the feeling in my gut. I don't scare easily, this stranger however terrified me. We were frozen in that state for another 20 minutes or so. When the train eventually reached the next station, I slinked out of the open doors. I still hadn't looked up from my phone. I didn't want to see that man's ghoulish face. I just wanted to get home. Once I was on the platform, I stopped walking backwards. I stood and waited, trying my best to watch the man out of the corner of my vision. He didn't move, he stayed on the train. The doors closed. I cried exuberantly as the train pulled away. What a fool you've made of yourself, Paige, I thought. You let anxiety get the better of you and now you're at the wrong station. Fantastic. Perhaps the foreboding feeling in my body had simply dissipated because I was no longer in the vicinity of that haunting man. Perhaps it was simply that his gaze was no longer upon me. Whatever the case, I felt normal again. I felt stupid and I began to stroll out of the station. I was bursting for the toilet. I hate public bathrooms, but I knew that I still had a long journey ahead of me, so I decided to face my phobia. I strolled into the empty bathroom, which was illuminated by a cold, clinical, fluorescent light. Choosing the first cubicle I entered and sat down, it opened up the Uber app. I was still about 40 minutes away from home. If I were to travel by car and most of the nearby Ubers were not really nearby at all. After about 10 minutes, I booked one, and I groaned at the text box, which explained that there would be a 30-minute wait time. 8 p.m., home by 8.40 p.m. Great, dinner and then to bed. The main bathroom door suddenly opened. I ignored it, continuing to scroll through my phone. Shoes clomped across the tiled floor. They were very heavy, slow, purposeful. The footsteps stopped. 
I looked down and saw two black, smart shoes poking beneath the bottom of my cubicle door. There are two other cubicles, I pointed out. A knock. Just one knock, that was all. I looked a little more closely at the black footwear and realized, much to my terror, that I was looking at men's shoes. Excuse me, I timidly whispered. Are you in the right bathroom? Knock. Oh, just get lost, I screamed. I hoped that somebody would come. I mean, somebody had to come. An awful feeling overcame me. Without fully accepting why I was doing it, I frantically opened my phone and messaged the Reddit user. I don't think you need me to tell you who's on the other side of that door. I asked my anonymous savior what I could do. Don't open the door. I told you to stay away from doorways. Just wait for somebody else to come into the bathroom. Remember, the morose man doesn't like to be disturbed. If somebody enters, he should leave. And so I waited and waited. I waited until the Uber came and left. And then something dawned on me. I could wait in the cubicle until the morning, surely. No such luck, according to my online guru. Closer to midnight, his patience wears thin. For now, he's polite, and soon he won't be. You should pray that somebody enters and interrupts him. I looked at the time on my phone, 8.37 p.m., and then I looked at the bottom of the cubicle door. The knocking had ceased, but the shoes remained. I leaned to one side on the toilet seat, peering through the crack between the door and the cubicle wall, hoping to catch a glimpse of the figure on the other side. Perhaps I wanted to prove to myself that it wasn't, in fact, the morose man. I couldn't see him, though. He was standing too far to the side. And then a face slid into view, peering through the gap between the cubicle door and wall, revealing the insidious thing on the other side. Its brown eye was now black. I screamed in panic, instantly jerking myself back to the center of the toilet seat, not daring to move. I wanted to keep messaging my mystery Reddit friend, but he also gave me the creeps. Why did he know so much about the morose man anyway? I searched for information about the malicious entity on the internet. Nothing. To calm myself, I decided to accept my position of powerlessness and simply scroll through social media. I wanted something grounded, something based in reality. I know I never thought that I would say such a thing about social networks. Wait, the police, I thought. I dialed a 999. It rang. I was asked which emergency service I wanted to reach. I opened my mouth to answer, but then the knocking continued. A series of frantic and raged thuds rattled the cubicle door back and forth. My mouth was open, but no sound escaped my lips. I was petrified. A shushing sound quietly hissed from the other side of the door. I hung up the phone. I suppose it wasn't a good idea to disturb the morose man. I paused. What other options did I have? I had the idea to ask the Reddit messenger to call the police on my behalf. But the morose man shushed me more aggressively, as if he were reading my thoughts. I thought of screaming for help and he unleashed a croaking wail that sounded like a feral beast caught in a bear trap. Stop trying to think of solutions. Don't disturb him. I waited. 9.27 p.m. Two hours of frozen terror in a train station bathroom, and I was running out of time. Trains kept arriving, but nobody was coming into the bathroom, and there wouldn't be any more trains before midnight. That meant there wouldn't be many more potential bathroom goers. With every passing moment, I replayed the Reddit user's message in my head. Soon, he won't be polite. 10.31 p.m. The knocking resumed. The overhead light had started to dim as if the morose man were gradually extinguishing it. I shuddered ceaselessly, lifting my knees up to my chin and wrapping my arms around them. 11.41 p.m. After four hours in the bathroom, I heard a train, possibly the last train of the evening, pull into the station. 
the bathroom door finally opened. Two chattering, inebriated women entered the room. I saw the black shoes of the morose man hurriedly scuttle to the cubicle beside me, and he closed the door behind him. Now oh, I hate having to touch those gross toilet door handles after washing my hands, one of the girls said. I'm gonna wedge this door open with my shoe. Chantel, I don't want to talk about bathroom doors, you're such an idiot, one of the girls said. Did you just see that man, Tara? Chantel asked. Don't change the subject, Tara spat. You know that guy in the club saw me first and... Tara stopped mid-sentence. As she saw me hurtle from my cubicle like a deranged animal slipping on the tiled floor, I sprinted for the exit. Yeah, I right, love. Tara drunkenly slurred. Please, I begged. Move out of the way, I need to get out of here. I had told you there was a creepy man in here, Chantel said, marching past me. He's been messing with this poor girl, I bet. Hey, mate! My heart sank as I turned to see Chantel strutting towards the cubicle door next to the one that I had just exited. She pounded it furiously on the middle cubicle door. Don't do that, I pleaded. Remember, the morose man doesn't like to be disturbed. Oh, we've got you, babe, Tara promised, patting my back. Chantel roared like a lioness and booted the cubicle's door inward with the one high-heeled shoe that she was still wearing. The door practically flew off its hinges, ricocheting off the cubicle wall. I held my breath, waiting for the man to charge at her. What the heck? Chantel gasped. He's not in here. Tara snorted with laughter. You idiot, you probably imagined him. Torrential sweat oozed from my goosebump-riddled flesh. The man had strolled into the cubicle beside me. I heard him, but where did he go? This wasn't right. This was all horribly wrong. I started to back towards the exit, bumping into Tara, who was still blocking the doorway. Chantel frowned. No, I'm telling you, Tara. The girl trailed off, looking in my direction. Her complexion turned paler than that of the morose man. Her eyes widened, her jaw slacked, and her arms fell stiffly to her sides. She unleashed a primal scream of horror. Consumed by unimaginable fear, I realized that I hadn't bumped into Tara. I took a few tentative steps forward, before slowly turning on my heel. The bathroom exit led onto a pitch-black train station. The lights were gone. The people were gone. All I could see was the morose man and the unholy act that he was committing. Tara's body was slowly being ingested into the gaping mouth of the black-eyed man. He had grown a foot taller, and his looming figure filled most of the doorway. His morose mouth had widened to squeeze at Tara's still wriggling body inside. He used the now abnormally long fingers on his gnarled and ghoulish hands to hold the girl's ankles. He was forcing her headfirst into his nightmarish gullet. I chose flight. Chantel chose fight. I started to back towards the cubicles, but the manic girl beside me ran towards the exit, screeching at the entity and begging it to release her friend. The man was still greedily swallowing Tara's spasming half-alive body, but he unwrapped the fingers on his left hand from her ankle and seized Chantel by the neck. As I continued to back towards the farthest cubicle, I watched the morose man complete one course and prepare for the next. Chantel was certainly much louder than Tara. She unleashed a series of short and pained yelps, her cries muffled by the inside of the creature's body as he slid her down his throat. I threw open the cubicle door and locked it behind me and immediately looked at my phone. 11.43 p.m. That traumatizing scene only lasted two freaking minutes. How? Shoes clomped against the tiles. I found myself back where I had started. I was trapped in the bathroom stall, staring at the shoes which poked through the bottom of the door. The morose man had grown so large that he could poke his head over the top of the cubicle door. The horrifying apparition which still wore that dejected expression shook its head at me. His morbid frown lifted into a sickening smile for a split second, 
and then it quickly returned to a state of moroseness. The man shook his head at me much as he had on the train. He always reminded me of what I had done wrong. I flipped the toilet lid down and clambered onto it, and squished my body against the back wall, trying to escape the wretched thing before me. The morose man was not finished. Midnight was fast approaching and his patience was wearing out. The elongated fingers of his two hands suddenly appeared, grasping at the top of the cubicle door. He violently wobbled in its hinges. I started to blubber looking down at the phone in my hand. 11.45 p.m. Every minute felt like an eternity and I wouldn't make it to midnight, I was sure of that. The man reached an arm over the top of the cubicle door, stretching his fingers towards the lock. It fumbled clumsily trying to slide the door open. I'm not going to stand here and wait to die. I turned to my right and started to pull myself over the wall of the cubicle beside me. At the moment that I landed on the other side, I heard the lock slide across. The monster barreled into the cubicle that I had just exited. I knew that I only had moments to spare, and so I fled the middle cubicle and ran towards the bathroom exit. Welcoming the dark embrace of the train station, I didn't pause to look over my shoulder. I already knew that the morose man would be following me. He could find me anywhere. And that was when I remembered what the Reddit user had repeatedly said. I told you to stay away from doorways. I know I was an idiot. While I hadn't believed in the morose man, not really. You can't blame me for going into the bathroom. I had already put the fright of the train out of my head. I viewed it as a moment of anxiety. As I ran across the train platform, however, I could no longer deny it. I looked over my shoulder. The man was striding across the platform. Slowly and surely, he was striding towards me. But he was slow and he wouldn't catch me. As long as I stay away from doorways, I can escape. I kept running. I ran until I reached the end of the platform. I realized that I had foolishly forgotten how to exit the train station. Oh, screw that, I thought. I don't want to go near doorways. Throwing caution to the wind with my life hanging in the balance, I jumped down from the platform onto the railway line. I followed the tree line to train tracks, stealing a glance at my phone. 11.51 p.m. I glanced behind me. The morose man was in pursuit, but he seemed taller now. Taller than any human. And he seemed faster, much faster. I had to get out of the open. I was too exposed. I darted to my right, entering the forest, and lit the way with my phone. No doors in the forest and the trees were tightly grouped together, so the gargantuan man would have to shrink back to human size if he were to follow. It seemed like my best option. I weaved between trees, casting my torchlight before me so as to not bump into anything. I didn't want to end up flat on my face. I didn't want to be the morose man's dessert. I heard that unearthly wail once more. It was terrifying enough to startle all the peaceful creatures in the forest. Birds flew from trees and grounded animals rustled in bushes, fleeing the scene. I switched my phone off and no more light. I didn't really think that it would make a difference. I had a feeling that the man could still find me, even without a light, even without a doorway. Just a few minutes, Paige. You need to last a few minutes. I tried to convince myself. Except for the sound of my shoes crunching against leaves, the forest was completely silent. I could scarcely see the outlines of trees in the darkness. The canopy of leaves above me prevented the moonlight from illuminating my surroundings. I heard the booming snap of what sounded like a thick tree branch. The man was close, very close. I wanted so desperately to check the time on my phone but I tried to rely on my body clock. Every second felt like an hour but I grounded myself. It must be at least 11.55pm, I thought. I crept forwards, failing at stealthily traversing the forest. Every step seemed to make noisy contact with leaves and twigs. I tried to quicken the pace. 
there was no use in concealing my location. He knew where to find me. I suddenly heard low breathing from a few yards behind me. Not daring to turn around, I screamed at the top of my lungs and sprinted ahead, roughly scraping my shoulder against the jagged bark of a tree. I grimaced, but adrenaline pushed me onwards. I fumbled for the phone in my pocket and used it as my flashlight once more. I also needed to know the time. I couldn't resist any longer. 11.59 p.m. Of course. I continued to swerve between trees, praying that I wouldn't trip, praying that I wouldn't bump into another tree. One more obstacle could be the death of me. Midnight. I couldn't believe it. I yelled victoriously, twisting around. My flashlight shone on the horrifying specter before me. The morose man was now the height of the trees around him, slinking his skeletal body between them, pursuing me. My heart thumped. Maybe the Reddit user had lied. Maybe the morose man never stops. I closed my eyes and I braced myself for death. I braced. And braced. Succumbing to a feeling of pure horror, I felt a brittle limb brush against my clothes. I opened my eyes to the man walking past me, brushing one of his spindly legs against my coat. I turned around, casting my light onto him, and I watched as the spider-like ten-foot-tall man vanished into the depths of the forest. If you ever see a morose gentleman, don't disturb him. Do not smile at him.